I'm Megan Burns. Yeah. 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 And here we are for the eighth time for our Saturday night main feature reading. In front of your faces, but not on the screens. I miss all your faces. Thank you for enduring with us, being there with us, supporting us as we move to that crazy time from online and back in the person. It's a really good um, So uh, before I um, get into introducing the readers for tonight, I just want to thank a few people that made the festival this year possible. Um, uh, first, I want to thank uh, Chris Dunn and with the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at Tulane, who um, uh, made it possible for us to put on this fabulous show last night there. Um, I want to thank also uh, Salgado and uh, uh, Marlon and Omar and Katharina. And Leah for for flying up here, being with us, and because uh, they didn't really sound like they made money on the deal, you know. I mean, we got them here, but that's about all we could do. Uh, and they they really came for fun, and, uh, and I think they had fun. I think they so. I heard I heard I got a text late last night, y'all. I was in here doing tech with Chuck, and I, Chuck, I got a text at ten o'clock from Bill Lavender. He's like, I'm on Frenchman. With Diamba and the Brazilian poets, and I was like, "Have fun! I'll see you in the morning. I'm in bed." <laughs> so now you know which one of us is the party animal. I know it's deceptive, but it's not me. Um, and I uh, also want to thank the, our board. Um, I mean, that we couldn't, we could not do this without them. Um, Jonathan Penn. Uh, who uh, handles all our tech stuff, is doing a live stream right now, always behind the scenes, but always there. Um, oh, was anyone there Thursday night? Woo! Y'all like that? Y'all like that place hosting reading Thursday night? Two of our board members there, Rodrigo Toscano, yeah. two in the back. And also, is Henry here? Oh, Henry's not on our board, but we want to say thank you to Henry as well. He's part of the Splice series. Oh, yeah. we, we call him the Splice Boys. <laughs> on stage now. <laughs> and uh, also, uh, all the other members of the board uh, Lisa Possel, who uh, coordinates volunteers. And, uh, where is she? Oh, there she is. This year. Tom Andy's at the door. Tom Andy's at the door. He's giving all of your money so that we can be yeah. on stage. Ben Morris over here. Sky, Sky Jackson. Charisma <laughs> Price. Jessica. Jessica. Oh, Jessica. We're winging it up here, folks. Yeah, I'm looking at the audience. Someone went out last night. Someone was in line. We're bad times. But I went out and woke up at 5 a.m. Do that. Oh, I'm going to give a shot. So uh, when, uh, when the board met and attempted to decide on who our main features would be this year, we thought who are two poets that we want to bring to New Orleans to um, 
to enliven the, the poetry community here and also to put in front of all of you who come from all over the place to come down here. You know, we've got people from Brazil, of course, and uh, as well as New York, Texas, Florida, um, uh, Washington, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Oklahoma Chicago, <laughs> where else? Albany, <laughs> Albany, California. <laughs> That's great. There's a bunch of California. <laughs> So and uh, so we came up with these two poets, and I uh, thank goodness we didn't have to go to a second choice because we didn't have a second choice. These were the two that we wanted. And, uh, so I'm very happy to be introducing the first reader for tonight, Harmony Holiday. <laughs> Harmony is a writer, dancer, archivist, filmmaker, and author of five collection of collections of poetry, including Hollywood Forever and Mafa. She creates an archive of griot poetics and related performance series at LA's music and archive venue 2220 Arts, a space she runs with several friends. She has received the Motherwell Prize from Fence Books, a Ruth Lilly Fellowship, an NYFA Fellowship, a Schomburg Fellowship, a California Book Award, a Research Fellowship from Harvard, and a Teaching Fellowship from UC Berkeley. She's currently working on a collection of essays for Duke University Press and a biography of Abby Lincoln, in addition to other writing, film, and curatorial projects. We are so happy to have her here, Harmony Holiday. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> so it's great to be in New Orleans. Um, I've only been here once before. My father was a Northern soul singer who came up through the Mississippi Delta to New Orleans and was on a label here called Minute in the late 50s through the 60s. And so one of the first things I did yesterday with a friend is we went to this record shop and I was like, where's the Minute stuff? And I definitely saw some, some people that were on that label. And so I'll try to channel that, some honor to that. Um, I'm going to read from MAFA, this collection that came out last year and is coming out later this year in the UK. MAFA, the word, is spelled like that. Unfortunately, it like I did go back and forth about calling the book this because of the MFA industrial complex and how it plays it. Like any writer in this era, in this country, who looks at those words, like might collapse them into MFA, but MAFA is the Swahili word for um, the Holocaust, so it's the word for the Black Holocaust, the transatlantic slave trade, and in this book, I um, personify it, and it's an epic about a, a woman um, who embodies those things. So I'll read from here, and then I'll read some brand new stuff after that. Inspection and auction. Breasts full, middled. Face, radiant, comfort girl or in-house breeder, equipment, ripe, unreconciled, no prior attempts, stance, bitter, ravenous, recoiled, hate makes her servile, buttocks, firm, raised, wide, hiding style, plain sight, petite frame, tribal marking on the face, above upper right lip, entropic, indent, mouth, full, careful, teeth, so hip, made to break the language open and fix her name a home. Likelihood of inducing the owner's empathy or love or lust, high. Likelihood she has suitors of her own kind, certain. Likelihood they will take the whip for her or run away when held at gunpoint, unclear. Likelihood the president will date her on stage, unknown. What are you even saying? Name, Mafa. 
bleeding black holocaust, astonishing surrender ma'at, kick rocks, those are diamonds. Beautiful walking graves chased off the water, skin perfect, no blemishes or permutations in pigment hair. Coiled star in the center of a tight afro scar of a star, eyes unimpressed. Still a little wistful, nose wide and aquiline at the same damn time, symmetry, impeccable, dangerous, tone of voice, bewildered, likelihood she's call, she called Jesus daddy. No father figures here, Mafa's tongue is in the world's mouth, annihilation. This is a story who is with, of a woman who has witnessed the massacre of her own family and cannot tell if she was helpful in committing, if she is committed, if she is always committing the crime she is always witnessing. And the commitment to witnessing is a commitment to crime. She watched them and held on to the memory of their killers so hard she cannot remember if they were her or hers belonging to her commitment to seeing them invited like company and she, their hired black witness. She cannot remember what she is committed to understanding. Um, <laughs> little bits of my breaking with assembly line I not that we begged to be stolen or mistook our killers for chaperones but I wanted the one who made a razor out of his jackals and carved stars into our skulls I dream of that neurotic negus van Gogh so good with his hands he cuts them off like wrong answers on a word song's bent wink it's getting cool to lose our minds. Insanity is ambition here, like doctor, lawyer, crazy nigger. A professional class flatters the captors, spend our time in danger, desiring shovels and pebbles for singers. In Mississippi, he asked me, could I kill him and leave him with Ruth by the river? Ever wonder who taught you that need is dirty? You be the backwoods ruby, mangling the new black fist into televisions who taught you dirty needing and some kinesis, this built-in longing for what oppresses filthy cargo. There he goes, ashamed of being ready or needy, needle elbow neatness. We're crazy about that tough, sweet sound. <laughs> Leading illusion. So this book is in four parts, by the way. So this is this part is called Say Her Name, and it's sort of trying to say her name. And then um, I'll mostly read from here, and then the last part that sort of dissolves into what I call a paradise of ruins. And so a little more of this. Leading illusion. Like someone who, who can hear into someone else's hearing, not a spy, but captive, clairaudient, binge listener, we all fake our deaths with her now. How about that boat, boat, cult, pyramid drifting off its fix into forever? Martha wants to learn her name before she leaps. She's ignored the massacre of her known family gleefully, of archaeology, of no bodies or steep evidence, but soft Atlantic rage blames herself for their fate. Is that vain? And then one day, isn't hums I should care, find spite where the terror was, and prayers for Malcolm, whose corpse smiles at her from the ocean spreading stutter mother, mothers. Hallelujah. The motherless empire. I should say with Malcolm there, um, I just talked to Fred Moten, the poet, who we probably all love and who loves the city and who is my homie and who is trapped in the Boston airport because of the weather. And we all know what Boston feels like. It's like a, it feels whack there. <laughs> it's like, like, let's be real. Um, it, it, I've had moments, glimmers of like, oh, maybe this place can get past itself. But like mostly I felt really like stifled in Boston every time I've been there. Um, and he's like, yeah, I have on my FOI Malcolm Blair in this airport. <laughs> and I was like, like he feels it too, but shout out to Fred. Motherless empire. These are my obsessions seduced into a second childhood. Not because I want to correct something, but be because Bess is more seductive as a runner than a whore. A praise dance like this. One we did in the mirror with Aunt Viv. Nothing referen referential the second time around, no referees, 
from commercial enterprise, nothing but the soil, the crop, the house, their bodies or second skin fell like hypocrisy, our sweet baby girl looking for reflective water in that fraying dust. Sometimes I feel that way and am that way. One piece of cloth for every piece of cloth I weave and bleach into statement in the sun and stain in the circus juice of berries, everything that is mine this time I am making. Rebirth can only come of this desire to take what's yours and embroider it in the code of first witness. This is my godless land, my country obsessive fantasy about the corner of a missing smile found in the owl's eyes, smirking, calling the mouth the liability, cracking the night with blurry accusations, weeping out of pity for the devil until what was convulsive split to slow moan, boat song, song of the recovered darkness. Song of how we long for that dayless day in secret. Song of how we killed it in a public square while its soul ran off to the eagle, heretic. There is a power that only silence chases in a language of pure gesture between dance and birth and no nation can claim it. And have you been the unmothered skin of early sky and bondage bound to the land as you torched it? Let's all read from section one. I'm just going to read a couple middle poems and then a couple from the end. Monsters of Innocence. She has his statue stacked flat on their backs like a coffin warehouse, a pout of serial numbers and glaucoma, at least. That's what she tells. He tells Mama while lighting the next blunt and humming some soul survival was so funny and incantatory. Two astronaut statues press to my ears while I sing Malcolm's Valentine. Malcolm's all over this book, I guess, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, my danger as her. Handlers lurk for saints, such scams. And I became a saint when I was seven. What plans we have, revolution, feather pillows, foam ones, former slavers for lovers, resurrection, cuddle here and there, and here again for salt, all infinite. In the trickling water, a tall, luxurious gentleman who is always nervous about his card trick, always sticking clubs in the bushes. His paranoia, other than being vain, is homely at this in the homely at the same critical moment of disaffinity makes it easy to sneak up on him with anaglesic, soothe, ask rude, nurturing questions, nurse his addiction to himself, and run out naked into the throat of the night. To tell on him, you fell on him. You know I'm Garintha, you know I'm Nafa, you know you're trapped in a cloth dark empty parking lot with God, your dealer in a lot of Sodom's moonlight. Right. This last section, The Paradise of Ruins, is really about um, using this, um, I have like the Motown, Pittsville, USA, it's about taking, it's about black music basically and how black music is sort of built of on all the bones of the things I talk about in the, the former parts of the book and sampling practice and um, the gestures that came from uh, resisting oppression turned into music because I think that's where uh, black life thrives here. So yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just gonna read a little bit of this. So here's a Southern Gothic tale that's true. Maybe it's time that we devour one another and this grandiose sharing could be the newcomers. The brainwave patterns of 40 subjects were officially coded with spoken words and silent thoughts of violent indoctrination we placated to learn to read. What a boring patience, the one for freedom. Here's Jimmy Baldwin, Baldwin in his apron, greasing a pan, some landline intervenes and endlessly bringing earth I've, revelations. I've been buked and the other side of heartbreak is not ambition. Crimson gauze wrapped in God's suicide. Some genocide is God's suicide adjacent and remote. That gory form of favoritism shot 44 times in the head. They announced readily, I will not dream only of safety and security. And he's never planning to be a minister in this version, just gestures of church, church in Greece. So duress, so wreckage, so woodshed bound in skeletal minstrel, so rope around the season skit when Moffa catch up with season of the witch. We made our calamity famous, endless, because it's not yet sublimated rage, 
His craven childhood, a rubric for the silly hope we all hide under our skin, buckets of candy and sweetness never expires, but its super fades to the faint fun funk of daylight in a B movie. The bad thing of having fake anatomy links cabaret to a brightly lit machine, and it occurs to me that these ruins are the blighted hue of an undone trance, and we might even love them and ourselves again. A massive habit tense muscle unfolding into the archive of vengeance, a delicate jest inside of which sharing became my coherence. We are atonal here and combed out God's dialogue so glad and disaster sigh bye bye tomorrow dies of longing and we go right on walking self hypnotizing no one ever told you how much you can heal in one day. Is it too solicitous is it effective to make such beautiful sounds. Or affect infected with such beautiful sounds? Is it the herd and instinct that makes words go round worlds down like poison? I heard most people don't experience catastrophic violence. Pity them. Watch Fletcher Henderson do a time step. He's so light skinned, has a Hitler mustache, speck of babble in the stillness of him, feet pattering like a police baton, not that it's bad, to vaguely resemble your own cap, your own, your very own enemies. All of life is predicated on a certain degree of possession. Not that the ruins are in exile from themselves or resembling their enemies, fantasies, a litany, a plan. Or a floating tendon, useful for early mystical initiation, a slur or tie. Rich homie Kwan or buddy guy, even Richie Havens, where does an improvisation begin and fizzle like some relations or no relation at all? George Clinton is crying in my arms, how an altruistic caution has a hinge on him and he'll never get to be maudlin again. Lonnie Howley's howling began then, moralizing captivity, that viral riffing he calls high lonesomeness, bipolar jonesing. What if I rip your heart out and turn it into a supermarket? The ruins mention that we were here. The demolition mentions art, omission, the crackle of fragments, miles whispering in my ear by the pool monk spinning his muteness into his rule visible tyranny of good sounding Duke Ellington chartering the mission of poison his vocal tone accusing himself of everything play that again look how she ate that he collapses into Mafa's annotated ruins emotionalism and light weapons weapons made of light that invert the theft and swarms and mention us adjacent to data point Warmth, Albert Eiler, dormancy, it's the sleeping for me. His refusal of his own sainthood at the club and complaints. They be drinking, they don't really be listening. Untranscribed injustice, injustice the welts after beatings and performances. How I used to be that devoted to the pathos of masculinity. I'd let it speak for me or silence me in grieving over giving. What they own of Mafa now is more complete in pieces, more of her speech, more of her genetics, not just her labor, but her recovery from overwork, the music of it, pastime pieces, drifting past paternity and other meek fixations. You can see this mischief lift her spirits and drop them like baker's flour to bleach and suffocate the birch and its glyph, indifference, addiction, trivial in the nervous palms of neglected girls who buy their own hair every second Wednesday. In the dilapidated every day, no bodies to recover, Black Art, East St. Louis, Port of Prince, Harlem, Watts, Newark, Detroit, You Boy, This Your Boy, Blueface, Motown Records, Strata East, Black Forum, Strut, Bust Down, You've Been Struck by Leaving, Las Vegas, for Dilla's Basement, Tremanisha, Ma'am, Sudden Irreverence, Reverend Nam, Aretha's Purses Full of Cash, Some Exposed, Midriffs, Low Level explosive, Explosives, Covert as business. Someday, someday I will wear Hype Williams, Venus by the time I get his synthesizer, anesthetic, breaking down Mariah, I call yesterday, Missy, Misty Copeland, Kathleen Dunham, Kyle Abram, breaking down into motion to the witness, federal regulation 45, they can sell live bodies, but they can't sell dead ones. Um, I'll stop there with Mafa. You know, I, my son's been old.
can't see where that was, but do I have time to read a couple new poems or should, sure. should we stop there? I don't know how long. Well, I see. I don't time myself. Okay. All right. I was going to play the music or some music, but I'm not going to. Um, oh, I mean, I could. Well, so something cool happened. Um, first of all, reading that I realized, I had this section that I wrote like two years ago about where I referenced George Clinton and Lonnie Holly. And in the past year, poetry really is like spell work because I've interviewed both of them. Um, just, you know, I've been asked for different publications to like write, interview both of them. And I'm like, oh, and those things were actually like true. So that was cool. But um, I also interviewed this producer who's Puerto Rican um, based in LA who produced some of, like, if people know the first track on Beyonce's Renaissance, um, these motherfuckers ain't stopping me. <laughs> like, he produced that, and he just has a really interesting sampling practice and is really into poetry. So after the interview, I gave him a copy of my book, and he wrote me yesterday, and he was like, I stole some ideas from your book to produce this song. And so I thought I would try to play it. It's an exclusive. Um, his name is Kelman, Kelman Duran. Um, let's see if this works. Anyways. If, it, if we had it on the sound system, that would probably be better, but I thought that was a cool thing. Um, now I'm just going to read new poems. I'm working on a book. I think it's, it's tentatively called Grief Slash Grift, but that's just like a, that's what I'm writing about. There's poems about um, grift, which I'm also thinking of as the rifting grift, the break, like Fred's in the break or brokenness, but then also grief, because I think that what I realized like post everything that we've been through since 2020 is that there is um, like a lot of people are deluded and a lot, there's like a lot of like lying to the self that has um, become part of the collective way that we relate to one another, like just things we don't talk about. And then there's a lot of grief. And so I think what happened for a lot of people is that like un, undealt with prior grief might have like um, been seeping into like the way that we grieved around the world changing between um, 2020 and now. So I'm just, I'm writing about that stuff basically. So yeah, I'm gonna read a couple things from that. Grief, disarmament. You're a terrible witness where stage outfits to test testimony and upon returning home in search of his remains, you are really hunting down his flesh of guns. There was a suitcase full of firearms in the closet to the right of the front entrance. Part of my inheritance, it's gone, missing. Only the love songs remain stuck there in a melting spiral, hoping to be imbibed. His guns have gone missing. They've become a nomadic violence as limber as fire itself when not confined to the mechanical or not registered to my long deceased father who was alive somewhere as his set of machines he collected for protection and leverage a substitute for literacy made a killing protecting me. Kept them manicured and close like comfort animals. Can they be traced now? Were they confiscated by the police after his arrest or sold at auction or held on to like the mementos of his lost soul? Did his brothers, mother, sister, cousins get any? Did they for one moment consider that his daughter might return not in search of a body or ashes or his gravesite or soul fragments, but demanding his weapons and instruments? A Yamaha keyboard and a 45, a stack of tapes, a box of bullets, the cloudy amber prescription pill tubes from his nightstand, barbiturates and high-pitched minerals, stale lithium, the timbre of shrill grocer roses, might as well imagine the chandelier ceiling and him shooting the bulbs down his target practice, orange shag carpet covered in glass shards like the undrawn eyes of a would-be muse shot down while high on sleeplessness. Speechless, mercurial is light itself, but he was never that reckless. The suitcase of guns he kept in the coat closet was locked. 
Yellow with silver trim, the glint of a childhood ring, code each rifle coiled inside of it in fetal serenity waiting to be needed the way an embryo waits its turn to unfold. My heart awaits the impossible verdict where they sold to white men who perch them against trees like candy canes at Christmas, reducing my father's intensity to sport. Or is one waiting for me behind the trap door of a future amnesia as my love of the kind of intimacy that expires as rage? I've outgrown that too. The most violent act of my life has been recovery. Now I must reclaim this rudimentary feeling of losing track of an object that never belonged to me, the material scapegoat for a psychic void, and I will take possession of it so that it releases me how a trembling finger lifts from the trigger of an unloaded scheme. His guns are missing, and I yearn for their stunted, butter-toned grip, which I would carry around like a briefcase full of his unlived dreams or swerve above my head like an erratic kite pretending our day at the beach together, bluffing until the sky turns fuchsia and embarrassment, severing my tie with the weapon's danger so they come out for me as ornament and beauty and everybody I once knew is strange and gagged in the closet, a suspect, gone. Um. Grift, perhaps a corruption of graft ever after, dishonest toil, broken work, what ifs to inspire you to switch direction mid deliberation or lament, I can hear the grift machine gearing up again while clapping for it on cue. Also the orbit of a broken verse in half clap like Dilla sampled from heart to skin surface and sipped unmapped, unbaptized, three fifths and gifted with favor in a swarm, oppressive favor skin first, or when we went to the circus and they yelled at your age, not your color, lift every voice here, make a chorus of breaks, miscreants, misremembers, embroiled in fluke and fantasy, took apart by their own charade, and pretty soon the hallucination sponsorship will come through, like hitmen called to duty, but bulky with luck, Fire on screen does not burn the screen. Your skin stares back at your ending unfazed, unchanged, hoping the skit resolves before it smudges the notion of real life burning or teaches passion to behave like luck. A quandary for the vicious theorists who mistake concepts for deeds or fates all day. Then when dusk arrives, pray for the flickering gasp of fake fire, scentless mute embers of my silhouette, which he calls human girl. and until my disillusionment afterwards, monster pusher, shows me a mirror where his reflection, with his reflection in it and says we made a movie, that it was romantic, that I was ticklish and blushing when I had been squirming and yielding all the way to Buffalo with the nauseous fumes of Chevy leather swollen on my blackened eyelids, so purple trying not to fall asleep inside the crime's dream right at the part where he declares his innocence and I parody mine for alms twirling, wishing to become the fix of glass that shatters in the back of his mind when I scream. And I'll read one last poem. <laughs> the newest of all of these in that series or one of them. Grief, confusion. I like your wedding with children. <laughs> um, some people rewrite the plot of Paris Blues in their minds. They're scanning the inevitable for flukes in the film. Sidney Poitier and Diane Carroll, two black Americans in Paris, fall in love. He's a jazz musician, she's a teacher. My mother, also a teacher, remembers him falling for Diane's white friend, who she's traveling with. We write ourselves into the leading roles we desire. I cannot blame her, but devote some time here to restoring the dominance of the intended plot. The friend disappears into a forgettable portrait at the Louvre. I mimic the Rodin and grab my own hand and run around the city promising Sydney his music is beautiful, embellishing a little. He promises me nothing. Then in the final scene, I'm ready to give up and oblige the subtle advances of his white friend played by Marlon Brando before he met James Baldwin and they fell in love. Sydney chases me down the train platform begging to be seen through my eyes again. 
and I'm just waving and crying, gloves made of matte black leather with a tutu of green lace that grazes me along the wrist like a mother might or a knife, trying to deter her girl from a favorite mistake. She is being too alive among dead ones. I wave frantically like I did when I hoped my dad might spot me coming around on the carousel at the town fair. Even then I felt perfectly abandoned, okay with it, inspired by it, pursuing it on my round note like a secret power I had to disguise as just being a, a little naive about how easy I am to adore and abandon. Why should romance change me? I lied too, baby, I lied. It's the love story I needed, the love itself. Then with your narcissism and my unconditional freedom, no, it's the love itself I've needed. Rewritten, abandoned, claimed again with more detached candor. So intense we dread it and demand it in the sequel. Sydney's career slumps after too many half-inspired records. Diane becomes a famous filmmaker and his ghost follows her around throwing rose petals and screaming until she writes him a scene. Maybe if, maybe if he had chosen the white friend, he might be thinking, but it's much too late for that. This is the scene. It is written. Without him, it's just as beautiful. Without her, it does not exist. The psychologists are calling it remothering, themselves also desperate to play love interests in the movies that aren't about them. Thank you. City poetry scene circa 2002-2005, and more specifically, at the Bowery Poetry Club, different poetry scenes started becoming aware of each other. We were all working, it seems, in shifts at the club once a week. One scene would read at five, then another would come in at six, then seven, and so forth. I remember sticking around and catching several readings after mine. That's where I first saw Tahima Jess. This was a pre-book era. I was blown away. Years later, we would appear in some journals together and read together. I think the last time was in Cambridge. Um, but here's a bit about Tahimba. Tahimba Jess grew up in Detroit, where his father worked in that city's Department of Health. His father later became the first vice president of Detroit's chapter of the NAACP. Jess's mother was a teacher and a nurse who founded a nursing school at Wayne County Community College in 1972. According to Jess, he started writing poetry at age 16. Within just a few years, when he was 18, he had won a second prize for poetry at an NAACP academic competition. He graduated from high school in 1984. Next, he enrolled at the University of Chicago, where he intended to be an English major and pursued his poetry writing. However, he soon abandoned, abandoned this as an option and dropped out of the university in 1987. During this time to support himself, Jess worked as an intern at a bank, as a community organizer, and as a substitute teacher in the public school system. In 1989, he returned to the University of Chicago and switched his major to public policy. Around that time, he began taking classes at nearby University of Illinois Chicago with the poet and scholar Sterling D. Pump, who became a mentor and realized uh, that his real passion was for poetry. Give it up for Professor Plum. Yeah. <laughs> Post class has focused on literary figures from the Harlem Renaissance and the Black Arts Movement of the 1960s and 70s, which inspired uh, Tahimba to start writing again. He graduated from the University of Chicago in 1991 with a BA degree in public policy 
He later pursued an MFA degree at New York University, which he received in 2004. The rest is history. <laughs> Tahimba, Jess, is the author of two books of poetry, Lead Belly and Olio. Olio won the 2017 Pulitzer Prize, the Asfield Wolf Book Award, the Midland Society Authors Award in Poetry, and received an outstanding contribution to publishing citation from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. It was also nominated for the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Penn Jean Stein Book Award, and the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Award. Lead Belly, his first book, was a winner of the 2004 National Poetry Series and was named one of the best books of 2005 by the Library Journal and Black Issues Book Review. Uh, the Library Journal called it a daring collection which blends forthright, musically acute language of portraiture. And the Publishers Weekly, in a star review, called it encyclopedic, ingenious, and abundant. And selected it as one of the five best poetry books of 2016. His fiction and poetry have appeared in many journals and anthologies, including Angels of Ascent, the Norton Anthology of African American Poetry, Beyond the Frontier, and many, 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 many others. Jess is professor of English at College of Satin Island. Let's give a warm welcome to Tahima. <laughs> Holiday came up here and laid it down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love all of the history and the uh, the image imagery happening. I just um, I'm always so impressed with everything Aunt Harmony does. I just want to say it's uh, it's really an honor to be here in in the fortress of art and uh, presentation devised by my good friend, Chuck Perkins. Woo you hear Chuck and me? Chuck and I go way back to our Chicago days uh, in the 90s. We were once on, a, on the Green Mill Slam team together. So yeah. Chuck is a, uh, a, a, I mean, a, a really amazing cat who always, uh, who has such a deep heart and uh, a keen, keen eye for um, the power and beauty of art. So thank you, Chuck. Yeah. Yes. And thank you to the Poetry uh, Board of the Poetry Festival, New Orleans Poetry Festival, to making this happen. So let me read some of these joints, huh? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> So I, I got a little bit new and a bunch old. So uh, here we go. Um, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> my aunt used to say to me, you know, in different places, it'd be like, uh, what it be like in Detroit, or what up though? In New York now, they'd be like, the shortening of this is, what's good? But I heard it first is, what you know good? And uh, from my down south, up north folk, what you know good? It's true. I ain't no good, but I do know better. I know the Detroit summers, furnace in fury, the shy town winter hawk beat down. I know the Brooklyn born treetops in spring. 
Their slow spun good of shadow I lean into. I know that ain't no good deed gone unbeloved by somebody got no sense. I got the good gospel of blues beneath my skin. And I know I got it good when I kneel before my baby's good thing. When I'm drowning in her silk soft goodness, greedy enough to squint the good hot air smothering our goddamns. I know I got it bad. About as good as it gon' get till I'm good and gone. The good foot slide stepping me on out this plane. Been told I ain't nobody's good man because I got a good mind to get good heavens with good weed that gets me golden smoky. What I know good, I know that you know, that they know, that we know, that don't nobody got the goods or warrants on me. As good as I can tell. See, you got the good hand, baby. I just barely got me this good credit. Just got me this good job. I was trying to get a good look out of this poem. Trying to keep it out the mouths of the good old boys. Perched like confederate statues on gilded plinths of God bless America's. I was trying to keep head above good times. Rising the good fight. Fried as good hair and twisted as good intentions. What I know good starts with a brick and ends with a book and bleeds in between. It walks through the screen door of promise with chisel sharp fine print tunneled deep in its smile. What I know good is like I said, I ain't no good, but goodness, don't I get a chance to make it all good before the bullet gets out the gun or the knee hits the neck or the noose gets hung or the bail gets set? You know good and well what the answer is. What I know good is what I left behind. And good God, what never leaves me, history. What I know good will always be enough to bury me. But here I am, good enough, ain't I, to rise up and tell you all I know. This one is, uh, uh, you know, you know, um, well, <clears throat> there's a, uh, a uh, great comedian, Paul Mooney. Paul Mooney, Paul Mooney, Paul Mooney fan. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you try and develop some kind of posture towards things that are happening. Uh, uh, and, and you don't want to, well, let me just say this. His, his quote for this, for this is, one hundred is, uh, I say nigga a hundred times before breakfast every morning just to keep my teeth white. <laughs> so, I decided to look at the science in that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is entitled, uh, 100 Times. Of course, I was skeptical, but because there's often wisdom in the hardest humor, I stood before the mirror one sunrise and began my morning chant. <laughs> All repeated calmly for the first week, but with flavors added on as the regiment continued into the second. 50 with ER and 50 with R. <laughs> one quarter as question, one quarter as surprise, one quarter as anger, one quarter implying the complaining please. <laughs> all altern alternatively whispered, shouted, laughed, snarled, all in search of the ideal whitening formula. <laughs> After four weeks, I remained skeptical. However, Perseverance paid off by the sixth, when colleagues remarked on my brightened, hazeless smile, when friends alerted me to a steely glint in my grin. 
I doubled the regimen to maximize results. <laughs> Week eight saw a two-third increase in brightening with a luminousness approaching diamond quality, particularly in the lower incisors. The uppers were sun white, never leaving room in their shine for shadow. Side effects became audible as well as visual. A small echo became perceptible after each repetition in my mantra, such that the cadence assumed a wondrous work song rhythm. Upon closer examination, magnifying mirrors revealed one small brown man peering into the side of each tooth's mirror-smooth enamel, each one appearing only briefly before each utterance. Alarmed but intrigued, I enhanced my treatment. Various gesticulations were added to the morning litany. Sneers, chuckles, sighs, and facial contortions were enhanced throughout. As a result, the echo's intensity increased from slight windy whisper to low murmur to small and steady chorus each morning. A daily affirmation of my will to shine. A halogen glare burned from my mouth throughout the day. I became a walking lighthouse of shine. The ritual has grown above and beyond me, through me. I wake each morning to stand before my mirror and before I open my mouth, I hear the chant begin above and around me as I were, as if I were in the middle of the mantra's core, as if I'm one in a circle of prayer. I found others who hear the chant with me, or they found me, those who raise up with me each morning to stand before our mirrors with the diamond sharp sound of ourselves, polishing each tooth until we gleam. Our number grows daily. We shimmer and shine inside the bulging head of our chant polishing our glowing mirrors, staring into the glare until we shield our eyes. So, uh, I owe so much to a denizen of Louisiana. Could he let better? Because I'm gonna tell you, I wrote this book, uh, and you know, you, you write something, you don't really understand what's happening in it until sometimes you're out of it. But Lip Belly is a man, not, not far from here, street poor, who uh, went to prison twice. Once for killing a man, once for almost killing a man. Sang his way out of prison, kind of, sort of, once, at an early release and then made up his mind to change his path with his art. And when I started writing this, I was in a very low place in my life. And Let Belly's story stuck out to me somehow. I think I grabbed onto it like a life raft in a raging sea. Let Belly's lessons. Mr. Haney owned Shreveport's general store, where a dollar a week brought my 12-year-old's frames lift and lunge of barrel and crate across a sawdust floor. Still, he wanted more. See, the guitar refused to get naked with Haney. He would fumble up the seams of its hidden croon, hook, clasp, and bodice of each tune, mangled down to a stunted strum. So he quit. He hoist the bourbon and order me to hoist song, the velvet locomotive of Merrill Deep Hum. I tow up from the swollen center of guitar, its catch and slide caught between palms and cradle across Louisiana Star. His bottle and scowl grew louder with each reel and jump that I played while getting paid 
to show the way of undressing music from its wooden clothes. But it was like coaxing stone to bathe in sky. He never let his flesh wallow in the blue floating round his earth. So he buried himself deeper in his own dirt. He think on the hurt a white man can do without second thought. He'd slur, nigga, someday I'm gonna kill you and stagger home. It was there, alone, in the dark darkness of me, that I first learned the ways of pure white envy. And thank you, Miss Dane, for teaching me. And this one uh, is in the, in the voice of his, uh, his long time lover. Never left his side once he found her. Uh, and she was uh, quite something. I can find this, this poem right quick. Uh, she was like, yay, hi. Very curvaceous. Her name was Stella. And she was his guitar. Uh -huh. Mr. Stella speaks. You think I'm his property because he paid cash to grab me by the neck, swing me across his knee, and stroke the living song from my hips? You think he is master of all my 12 tongues, spread notes thick as a starless night, strength and spine till my voice is a jungle of chords? The truth is that I owned him since the word love first blessed his lips. Since hurt and flight and free carved their way into the cotton-fused bones of his fretting hand. Since, since he learned how pleading men hunt for my face in the well of their throats till their tongues are soaked with want. Yes. Each day he comes back home from the fields, from chain gang fury, from the smell of sometime women who borrow his body. He bends his weight around me, drinking in my kiss of fretboard across fingertip till he can stand up straight again, aching from what he left behind, rising sure as dawn. Yeah. Uh, fa fascinating. I spent like a lot of time uh, researching Lead Belly and uh, Actually, I uh, it was about five years, and if there was anybody had, had written anything about Lead Belly, I was going to track him down, track him down, and find it. Um, so at a, uh, a certain point, you know, I realized, you know, you think about work songs, and this is a song that I learned as a tot in grade school, and it was just a just something fun to sing. And I didn't realize the origins of this work song. And I started to really, started to really close in on me the realities of this, this song. When I started to understand that when Lead Belly was in prison, uh, he would uh, be the, try to be the number one roller on the number one game, trying to pick the most cotton so that he could get good time. You know what I'm saying? So uh, this is Lead Belly Sings to his number one crew, and I think you might know this song. Gonna jump down, spin around, pick belly cotton. Jump, jump down, spin around, pick belly day. Oh, Lottie, pick a belly cotton. Oh, Lottie, pick a belly, pick a belly. Jump down, spin around, pick a belly. Jump down, spin around, pick a, pick a. Gotta jump up to go down in the bottom land. A brown bird of sweat strapped to a sack of feathered stone. Gotta tumble down to the basement of hell after I done lifted up to heaven and the steel-toed angels kicked me back under the sun's bright red sickle. 
dripping with dawn, spinning in a sky so, so dizzy with heat till it spills its weight on my back and wraps its blistered arms round my neck, pulls down till I pick 500 pounds of dirty cloud from prisoned up farm. I mean, I mean, one ton a week. I mean, 52 tons a year. I mean, bail after 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 bail because it ain't no bail. I mean, what? Could I make if I had bail and all the bails I ever picked? 10,000 handkerchiefs to dry my mama's tears. 20 years of double breasted suits to glide home in every day. A, a new tie for every time I strut through a feel good woman's smile. A fresh tablecloth for every homemade meal I miss. And if I took a scrap from every denim and linen and dyed piece of cloth that got spun from them bales, could I patchwork a shroud wide enough, heavy enough, bright enough, dark enough, mended and torn and mended enough, heavy enough? to lay this place to rest? And what if I set that shroud on fire? Gonna jump down, spin around, pick a bell up. Dang, gonna, got to. Can't say no, can't walk away. Got to jump in, jump for the sun, jump against sky, jump across pain, jump up when I'm beat down by the riverside where my sword and shield is my song and my word and my breath and my mama spun around and slapped me down when I lied and stole. And if I only had to listen to my mama, I wouldn't be in the shape I'm in. Hanging around the whiskey still and drunk on gin is what I picked, is what got me here. Picking my way through this hand to stop, to bow, to bag, to hand to stop, to bow, to bag, to reach, to tw twist, to pluck, to stuff, to reach, to twist, to pluck, to stuff. A blizzard of casket-sized bales, heavy enough to outweigh me and all I've ever owned. Big enough to coffin up the boy I was before a pistol flash made me man. That schoolboy smothering in the soft strangle of cotton that I heave up from soil every day, every day, every day. Oh, Lottie, oh, Lottie, pick a bell of cotton. Oh, Lottie, pick a bell of cotton. Oh, Lottie, Jesus, God, did you ever carry a cotton sack? I mean, did you ever feel the bud in your hand? I mean, did you ever lift a bell like you lifted that cross, Jesus, and did it weigh as much as a cotton field? And when you show me the holes in your hands and feet, can, can I show you the blisters in my hands and feet? And can we size up the lashes on our backs? And when you fell in the sun, in the dust, in the thorns, did they wipe your face? And did, and did they look, did you look at the cloth and see my face scorched in the cotton of the cloth? And was my mouth wide open, my eyes squinted up from singing this song every, every, every. Oh Lordy, every, 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 pick a bell, every, 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 oh Lordy. How y'all doing? Yeah. All right. All right. So um, now this book, Olio, uh, Sprung from, uh, sprung from wondering where Black Belly got his inspiration. He was born in 1885. I was wondering, what was Black music before this era of recording? Who were those folks? And so there's, uh, Olio is the middle part of a minstrel show in which a, a group of acts come together and they share their talents. Could be a mus musician, singer, contortionist, comedian, you know, minstrel show was the primary form of American entertainment throughout the 19th century and deep, and deep into the 20th. Arguably still here, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and um, it, from it sprung vaudeville and of course the Great White Way, Broadway. Yeah. But these are, this is about what is it like to be a black artist against the backdrop of the minstrel show. So I think I'll uh, I'll share just a couple from this and uh, we'll keep it moving. All right. So there's one person who really kind of um, 
there's a few, so many people that stuck out for me here. But one is uh, Sissy Rada Jones. Sissy Rada Jones is an amazing opera singer. And uh, she toured the, toured the world with a kind of a minstrel troupe. But uh, Sis, uh, Sissy Rada Jones was really um, just uh, the first, uh, the first black person to sing at Carnegie Hall, really before it was even called Carnegie Hall. That's what Sissy Rada Jones was. But here's the thing: they they uh, um, they got to call it Black Patty because there was a white opera singer named Patty. And, uh, you know, they tried to obscure her, her, her genius by pasting this white name. Over. So this is, my name is Sissy Rada Jones. Once word got out about the way I sing, the world wanted to bleed all the sass out my name, to scratch out the Grip the gift my mother gave me and shove a would-be white diva in my spotlight. They couldn't imagine the colored in coloratura standing on its own on stage. So they claimed I was just part of Adelina Patty's chorus. They stuck me beneath her name. A shadow sentenced to the borders of her life called me Black Patty. But the darkened sense inside my name won't be silenced. With its sister and shush and gospel of ocean, I sing each night from the way I stand up on the docks of Providence. A straggle boned bundle of lungs and tremble, lifting wave after wave into wave after wave of Atlantic. The applause keeled over me, calling calling me with its belt, its bell of salt, its belly of sunken holes, its blue-green fathoms of tremolo. Every night in the dark off stage, I hear my mother's voice in my head, her backyard hum, the sea in her distance with the weather of storm. She look out and see the thrall of water heave its back to the sky. I look out to the darkness and hear my true name. And uh, this is other gentlemen. You know, uh, there's 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 two blind gentlemen in this. One is blind Tom. Another one is blind Boom. Uh, blind Tom was born uh, blind and autistic. Blind, uh, and he, he was more or less owned by his masters through the entirety of his life. He was born in around 1849 or so. After uh, emancipation, he was really not emancipated. And he, he was managed right by that uh, family till the day he died in the early 1900s. And he earned that, that, uh, that family about a million dollars in 1800s money. The other one is Blind Boom. And Blind Boom uh, was a fascinating character. He was born in 1865. And uh, Blind Boom had, had an interesting story because he was born directly, well, at the age of six months, he caught encephalitis, a swelling of the brain. And uh, it was no, obviously no real medicine to take care of it, just a surgeon. And uh, your brain keeps swelling, you will die. So the only way the surgeon had to relieve the pressure on the brain was removal of the eyes. Oh. Lion Boone's blessings. Bless the fever in that night, in the sixth month of my life. Bless the fever, for it gave me sight. It swore my brain to fit God's gift. It brought the hand that would lift each eye from my infant skull. Bless the sweat, my baby ball. 
Bless the horse that hauled the surgeon through dusk's dark, half drunk and swearing into mine. Bless the flame that sterilized the metal of the spoon. Bless the path between lid and bone, slipped and slid by that instrument of my deliverance from sight. Bless the handling of the knife. Bless that night they gave me night, wrapped around my bloody face, whispered how I could be grace notes, arpeggios, a piano roll of sound, copying each note from everything around me. You see, I'm sure at first there was the hurt and the scalding pain. But then again, blessing in its too short memory. See, all I know is what lies beyond light. I've learned this is what's right for this one right here. Yes, bless the fever. Then listen close. Spare near to this piano and shut your eyes close. Oh. Cut time for one, one more. Yeah. This one I want, I want y'all to help me out. Um, uh, and uh, this one is Blind Boone's. Well, later on in his life, Blind Boone uh, wanted to record for a pianola company. But you sit at the p player piano and you're the, the, the pianist that the pianist that actually plays the scroll into existence, right? So uh, they did not think that he was really good enough for that job. He took umbrage to that. And what they didn't know is that Mr. Boone had a standing bet. Cause he had a phonographic memory, okay? He had a standing bet for all his performances. If you came up and you played something, he would play it back note for note, wow. or he would pay you $1,000. And a, that's a good deal today. Yeah. I don't know no piano players doing that right now. Yeah. But you remember that figure, $1,000. Okay? All right, here we go. Blind Boone's Pianola Blues, all right. They said I wasn't smooth enough to beat their sharp machine. That my style was obsolete, that old rags had lost their gleam and lunge, that all I had left was a sucker punch. They couldn't touch their invisible piano man with his, with his wind up gutless guts of paper rolls. And so I went and told them that before the night was through, I'd prove what the sun of an ex-slave could do. I dared them to put on the most twistiest tune, to play it double time, while I listened from another room past the traffic sounds of the avenue below, to play it only once, then to let me show note for note how that scroll made its roll through Chopin or Bach or Beethoven's best. And if I failed, to match my fingers and ears with the spinning gears of their invisible pneumatic piano scholar, I pay them the price of $1,000. There you go. And what was in it for boom? You might ask. Well, might be the same thing that drives men through mountains at heart attack pace. Might be just to prove some task ain't meant to be neatly played out on paper and into air, but rather should tear out from lung, heart, and brain with a flare of flicked wrist and sly smile above the 88s. And of course, that ever human weight of pride that swallows us when that thing's done just right. But they were eager to prove me wrong. They chose their fastest machine with their trickiest song and stuck it in a room far, far, far down the hall from me. They didn't know how sharp I can see with these ears of mine. I caught every note 
even though they played it in triple time. And when I played it back to them even faster, I could feel the violent stares. Heard one mutter, lucky black bastard. And that was my cue to rise, to take a bow in their smoldering silence and say, not love, my friend, but the science of touch and sweat and stubborn old toil. I bet these ten fingers against any coil of wire and parchment and pump. And I left them there to ponder the wonders of blindness as I walked out the door into the heat of the sun. you've had to do with his legacy and particularly the rights and everything. And that, that really informs the work that you do. Uh, they, they, like, I, I just feel so much, so much detail in the and in, in humanity and the history that you bring to your work. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, well, I guess I opened the reading a little bit talking about him, but um, I mean, I think part of that, like the things you're talking about in Olio, of uh, musicians who were at a so-called disadvantage, who couldn't see or couldn't own uh, the rights to their own bodies or their body of work. Um, my dad's sort of in that tradition. He was born in 1934, um, you know, second generation. He was still a sharecropper or what um, the white version of that is called a tenant farmer, but he was just, they were on the land and beholden to it and so he was like that that guy who wanted to get out of town but there was he was also picking cotton from 12 until he got out of town and never taught to read and so I think there is an element in my personality and spirit of kind of like retribution um and in language mastery because he was so good at language but he was also always getting um, played by contracts and when I'm writing about now I'm writing a lot about his gun collection and what guns meant to him which is a pretty taboo thing to write about now, which is what I, I like to tackle those things that no one wants to talk about. But I think there's a corollary between, um, you know, the violence that's visited upon someone who can't read and then the violence that is enacted. And so, I don't know. I think that part of, part of the reason he stays in my work is because of that. Yeah. Any questions from the uh, audience for now? Shout it out. What's your favorite Funkadelic album? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. That's like, I just, I love Funkadelic. I don't know if I'm going to. ask your favorite chapter of a, of a story. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't say. <laughs> I can't commit. Maggie Brain. Maggie Brain's, <laughs> that's the top. Yeah. Yeah. We got one right over there. There's one in the building. Yeah. 
Well, uh, repeat the question. Yeah, the, the question was was more or less uh, about uh, the sense of timing and rest in in the in the act of reading, and what is our what is how do we come to our understanding of how how we how we approach that subject. I, I mean, I would say um, I learned a lot on the slam circuit, and and, and I, I I learned a. I just paid attention. I mean, I'm more of a kind of like a storyteller. Is the way I, I kind of approach it, and uh, I uh, I uh, sometimes I make them. I, I, I try not to be over the top, but I try. I, that's where I go, and uh, I just I just like to caress the inside of the of the of the paws, and then launch out. Um, for me, it's different because I'm much less of a narrative storyteller and I like story and sound, more thinking about like a free jazz tradition. Um, and I like, I need things to like sort of permute within a phrase. And so that's why I'll hold attention until um, on the page that means like spaces in the middle of lines and things like that, that maybe only make sense to me, but I feel like, um, yeah, just like the idea of form and breaking with form. Two more. Sweet. Yes. It's loud, so people can hear. So, one thing I love about both of you is when you talk about community and how you reference the work. I was wondering if you could talk about what does community mean to you and how you reference the work. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say a couple of things. I, I, I do want to do a couple of shout outs here. One, Mona Lisa Sloy is in the audience. I'm also going to put a shout out to Kalami Yasalam. Who uh, actually was one of the people that introduced me to, to a kind of, kind of electronic community. Back in the 90s, he was putting out this sort of about where to give, give me the idea of submitting my work, um, which at that time was like just a new thing for me. Um, and I'm also going to uh, shout out a, uh, a fellowship of poets that I'm involved with, Kaveh Khan, C A V E C A N M, since 2017. And um, it's a fellowship of Black poets that, that uh, meets every summer. And uh, you can go for three, six, three years, and then you and then you have to kind of be on your own. You can teach for three years, be on your own. But what it does, what it's done for uh, for black poetry is just uh, really take it to an entirely different uh, place. Take it, take it. Really, uh, I wouldn't really be honestly standing here. Uh, reading this without the help of the Fellowship of Kavi Khan, which, which introduced me to the idea of workshopping, woke my ass in workshop, and got me ready and, and taught me how to show me how to how to be a poet in in the world. You know, so uh, I'm really uh, pleased to be a uh, president of the board at this moment. Kavi Khan. It's, it's really we didn't answer the second half of the question. What's the second half? Which is, how, <laughs> how is it? How is it? I'm just, I'm kind of messing with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you didn't, but it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just trying to buy myself time because I don't, um, my relationship to community is much, it's both equally formal and less formal. I kind of start out, I'm kind of a hermit on some levels. Like I've never been to Kave Khanum. I, when I was an MFA, I didn't necessarily like look to be, I need a lot of alone time to do my work, I feel. And I, at the same time, I'm really obsessed with archives and 
liveness and live music and collective improvisation that we find in jazz music. So when I lived in New York, that meant that I would go sometimes alone. I befriended the, the Times jazz critic by luck. And so he would take me to a lot of jazz shows and then sometimes I would go alone. And one time I went alone and happened to meet Amiri Baraka at a John Faddis show. Just like we both went to the uh, late show at Blue Note. And that opened up what community meant to me. And I started, he really became a kind of like mentor figure who I then, I had always followed his work, but I looked back at his body of work and the way that he was really not just writing about music and liking it. Cause sometimes I think that especially now the way that they have unfortunately like kind of taken the arts into the university and then divided them so that we don't understand that they're all the same thing. They all come from the same impulse. Um, I worry about it because I grew up dancing and then when I got, you know, fell in love with just being on the page and knew that I probably had to be a professional writer, I had to give up a dance community in a way. It was really like this direct choice. Like I was teaching dance and I was involved with dance, but then you had to go over here and do this other thing and people are so concerned with networking and the way, anyways. So I kind of just modeled myself maybe subconsciously at least after how Baraka had moved. And he was just like, he went where the stuff he loved was. And I think that one of that, you know, bringing the arts into academia sometimes means that as a living, working writer, we can admire music and dance, but we don't go see it because we're always wrapped up in, what, so I just, I try to be places. And now in LA, um, if anyone ever comes to LA, I run this space called 2220 Arts that, is a jazz club and has a literary venue and an archive. And so it kind of fell or forced its way into my lap to start building community that way. And one of the things we're working on is a festival that will bring artists from different disciplines into conversation, um, like a quarterly thing, so. Can I ask a question? What's your favorite work of uh, art by James Baldwin, whom I admire and revere. You know, um, uh, the short story, Sonny's Blues, that's, that's, that's the one that, I have to say, I mean, that's the one that influenced me personally the most um, because of its it's, it's, it's uh, the, the ability, the way he so carefully uh, constructs the characters. He gives such you know, uh, detail to the backstory. And then at the end, the, the, the releases, Sonny hits the stage and you see, the, you see the, the kind of trembling that's happening within Sonny as he manifests himself in full before his before his family really for the first time and so he's so in my that that is a really that, that's my my favorite piece of james Baldwin's work. for me it is probably the devil finds work which is maybe not as often read it's a collection of essays on film um again with that thing i think about a lot with artists being confined to one area of the arts. He was pretty obsessed with film. He actually wrote the first script to a Malcolm X uh, biopic that was never actually made. Um, he called it One Day When I Was Lost. Um, you know, his whole, the rumors of his affair with Marlon Brando. Um, he, he just loved film. And so this book on film, he writes about everything from like poltergeist to, um, I, I mean, there's, he covers so many films and it's such a beautiful, it's almost like a tone poem for American film. And so I highly recommend that. I think, think that's it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much.
So my question to y'all is, how do you know when it's time to stop your research and start writing? For me, um, it's hard because I I research a lot of different areas of things kind of obsessively. Like I'll get in, I'll go down different research tunnels, but usually it, it's when I do this thing I call improvising with the archives where I'll like transcribe um, and inter like let's say I'm listening to a James Baldwin interview, I'll start transcribing and that will get me into like when I'm veering off into my own thoughts and want to start writing, that's when I start writing for the night or the day. Um, at least with poetry. And so for me, it's when I stop transcribing just kind of naturally, it's like an, a body thing. I'm just like, oh, I don't need to, like I turn it off and I'm turning it down more than I'm listening, so. Uh, yeah, I would say that um, uh, basically uh, in, my, in my process, I, I really try and find as much as I can read about somebody and I read and I read and I read and uh, I try and get an understanding of the place, the time, the people that surrounded them, and try and uh, get an understanding of where they went. And then at the end, you have a blank piece of paper uh, that you have to lie on. <laughs> lie between the facts. And that's where the story is. You know, it's not like, like I know that these things actually literally happen, but I don't know literally what was going through their heads. But that's when the imagination has to come in. And um, usually it's a process of, of doing a lot of research and then writing and then doing some more research and writing. It's, it's like one feeds the other kind of sort of, you know. I have a general map of where, where I'm going to go. But sometimes that map changes. You, don't, you never know. You never know. So uh, you just have to, you know, and the way I see it is, at the end of the day, it's going to be that blank page that you have to take that leap and, and hit it. You know? And then at the end, you know, it's, it's only words you can always check. It's called drafts. Thank you. Thank you all.